20 years now, and up until about eight years ago, I was very happy with the work I was getting from shoeing horses, or the results I was getting from shoeing horses, but there were some things that just weren't quite right. And in 1994, I, I, the opportunity arose for me to become a blacksmith uh, at a museum in upstate New York to learn traditional blacksmithing. I thought if I could learn to make the best horseshoes and do the best work in iron that I'd be able to help these horses that I just seemed to feel that I just quite wasn't getting the right of the foot under the horse. For some reason, I was always chasing those underrun heels we hear so much about, those long toes. Each time I went back to the horse, I'd see that I'd have to back that toe up or remove flare when I did it traditionally. We have a way of traditionally balancing the foot. Well, after working two years at the blacksmith shop, I felt very comfortable with my skills as a blacksmith. I could make just about any shoe you could imagine, be it a heart bar, an egg bar, uh, wide web shoes, regardless of the type of shoe I needed, I could make that shoe very quickly and efficiently, and I understood what its function was. Because for the two years that I worked at the blacksmith shop, there was something that was really driven into my head. The master smith, who was very traditional from the 1800s, treated me as an apprentice, and in being so, I had to keep a journal on everything I did. And in that journal, I had to write every step that was required to do whatever job I was doing. For instance, a simple wing nut had to be detailed in the journal as to how that wing nut was made. I had to understand the material I was working on. I had to understand the function of it, and I wanted to understand the performance. And that mindset stuck. And after two years of working there, and I left the museum with the skills to make these really good horseshoes, I realized that I always followed that same formula. Structure plus function equals performance. And it was fine. I went out into the field, and I started working on horses. And I'd get to a horse that I decided needed an egg bar shoe. And I'd go to my truck, and I'd pull the stock out that I needed. I understood the structure that I needed. I needed a mild steel with a full swedge, whatever the case may be. And I'd forge the shoe. I knew the function of that shoe, and I knew what type of performance I wanted from that shoe. I'd get to the horse, I'd pick up the foot, and I'd begin to trim the foot. And the first thing that came into my mind was that same formula that I had been following for the last two years. What was the structure, what was its function, and what performance did I want out of that horse's foot? I was at a loss at that point. What was the structure? Had the structures of the horse's foot truly been defined? Were we taught that as farriers in the schools? Did we truly understand those structures and their function? And if so, did we truly understand what the performance was? If I were to ask each one of you what the function of the horse's foot was, you would probably reply the same as farriers and veterinarians do today. What do we think of as function in the horse's foot? What is the function of the horse's foot? When we think about that, we think of such things as shock absorbency, stability, or allowing the horse to stand, locomotion, allowing the horse to move, Often we hear shock absorbency coupled with circulation. As I started to plug in the values into this formula of structure plus function equals performance, I quickly realized that this was not function, but performance. Isn't what we truly want out of the horse's foot performance to have that horse be able to move as best it can, to be stable after a jump, to be able to stand and to be comfortable standing so that it may sleep comfortably, isn't it that we want the horse to be able to absorb as much shock in that horse's foot so it protects the bones and the joints of the leg? Those were all performances. What of function? What values could I put in there for function? As I started to research the numerous papers that, there are, that were out there, thousands of papers written, I quickly came to the realization that these papers, though good papers and a lot of good research, was very simplistic. We saw studies on various structures and their functions, but there didn't seem to be an overall model on how the foot functioned. After a short period of time, I started to put together a theory, if you will, called the suspension theory of foot dynamics to answer those questions. And there are three very simple questions. And that is what I found is the only way to progress in a science is if you have very simple questions to ask so that you can have the answers. Well, the questions that I asked were quite simple. If the structures have been defined and their functions have been defined, has the stimulus to produce healthy structure 
and function been defined? And if this has been defined, does the act of shoeing the horse in any way promote the stimulus we need to achieve function in an effort to establish proper structure in the horse's foot? Pretty simple questions. Well, as I researched this, I quickly came to the conclusion that we have not defined each individual structure in the foot and the functions they have while working one with the other. If that's the case, how could we possibly develop a model that could be used in the treatment of the horse's foot in the farrier sciences? I was a bit lost at this point. I started to look at all these different theories and looking at the hoof from one moment in time because the foot goes through a range of change throughout the stride of the horse. So it was most logical for me to pick one moment in time and define that moment in time as to what was happening with the horse's foot. Well, the most logical moment in time was impact. When most people think about expansion and contraction, when most people think about the foot pumping blood to absorb shock, it acts as a pump. Well, I started to look at the foot very carefully, did a number of dissections, look at a number of trims that were being done and how we treated the foot traditionally. And I started to develop further questions because there were things that became apparent in anatomy that didn't make a lot of sense, not when we apply traditional thinking to it. For instance, if the frog is truly considered a pump or a shock absorber in the bottom of the horse's foot, why the shape of a triangle? That didn't make much sense to me. Why a triangle? Well, we say it, it aids in traction. Well, that makes some sense. A triangle will enter the ground or enter the soft dirt and provide some resistance in the form of a triangle. But as a pump and as a shock absorber, why not more like the pad on the bottom of a dog's foot? Wouldn't that make more sense? Well, as I began to look at it, I still was thinking along very biomechanical terms, terms that we used in the blacksmith shop, thinking of angles, thinking of uh, leverage, thinking of things that were very common to think about back in the 1800s because the science that we had to study the horse's foot when the horse was so popular was called static mechanics. This was a science of levers and pulleys, which was very, uh, it was efficient and it was usable for the slow pieces of equipment we had. We didn't need a more complicated science. And at that time when the horse was so popular, the, the researchers that were researching the horse used static mechanics to explain how the foot functioned. As we look at it today, there was a break in our research. Around the 1900s, the industrial age came in. The horse became, well, it went to the back burner, if you will. And all of that research was put aside. And a new science was developed to deal with the faster machines of the time, the steam engines and the machines that were needed to make zippers and to make shoes. And they needed a science called kinematics, which was a science that dealt with these faster, more complicated machines. Following the, the industrial age, there was about a 50-year period before the horse became popular again in the form of a recreation or racing industry. And we start to see research begin to pick up again. The university starts studying the horse, but what they do now is they begin to use kinematics in their studies. Well, as we start to look at the horse's hoof, I found that most of the studies that we see are extremely simplistic. And if you would talk to an engineer and show them these studies, they would say it's far too simplistic. And there's, an under, there's a reason for this. Money isn't there to, for the, the very uh, in-depth studies that we need. So they're basically very simple studies with small samplings. It's a very difficult subject to study. Well, some of the studies that are out there, we took them and put them together into uh, bits and pieces like dots on the wall and connecting the dots until we were comfortable with a theory, which I call a suspension theory of hoof dynamics. When I look back at the hoof and what happens at that moment of time of impact and we look to see what's happening, how is it absorbing shock? I'm still thinking at that time biomechanically. Well, I look very carefully at the hoof and I'm analyzing what that frog does. Well, if it's meant to pump blood, again, why that triangle? Well, I started to look at it, and I looked very carefully at the hoof wall. And as I looked at the hoof wall, I started to realize that the hoof wall itself is much more complicated or more complex than we had believed. I didn't see that the hoof wall would act as a shock absorber, but more so as a spring. And the inner wall, which I'll explain to you as, as we progress in this video, you will see acts as a shock absorber. What I need to have done to absorb shock is actually a dissipation of energy.
Well, a spring does not dissipate energy. It stores and releases energy. A shock absorber dissipates energy in the automobile in the form of dampening, which is the release of energy through heat. Well, as I looked at a number of theories that are published out there on hoof function, I saw two that really, came, that really started to, to work for me, that would work in the very beginning of establishing this formula or this theory, if you will, on how the foot functions. One of them was by a gentleman named Smedgard, and it was titled Flexion on how the foot actually flexed or distorted and converted the kinetic energy of impact to elasticity. As I examined this, I started to realize that perhaps the hoof wall wasn't really absorbing that energy, but it was dealing by storing the energy and releasing the energy at the time of breakover. If that was the case and the frog wasn't actually acting as a shock absorber, what was it acting as? Well, as I looked at it, and I Actually, it happened one day when I picked up something as simple as a paper plate. And I'm going to pick up this paper plate, a very inexpensive model, by the way, which you can do at home. And I have a paper plate, which actually is a very good model of the bottom of the horse's foot, complete with sole, our own little white line, and I have cut out where the frog goes. Looking at the anatomy of the horse's foot, I'm going to pick up a model here to show you. We can see that the hoof wall is attached firmly in the front portion of the foot. Yet in the back, we have a large portion of soft tissue. Here's our frog, the V in the bottom of the foot, the bar, and the outer wall. This is not a very good sample because it's a very poor quality hoof. As we look at that, and I said to myself, if this hits the ground and we want to absorb shock, the heel's going to hit the ground first. There are a number of studies that have been done in the past 15 years that have proven pretty much without a shadow of a doubt, that the horse tends to land to the heel first. Though it may not be perceivable to the eye, we'd like to see the horse almost landing flat. We now know that the horse does land to the heel. If that's the case and the foot has to deal with this energy, how is it going to do it? Well, if the foot has to distort, and I did not have the V of the frog, you could see if I took it here that I have difficulty distorting the foot. But if I cut a V in here, just like a frog stay, and I were to land in one heel, you'll see that the foot or the plate distorts behind the widest part of the foot itself. That distortion is being generated in the back two-thirds of the foot, precisely where our soft tissue is in the back two-thirds of the foot. One of the problems that we've created in traditional farrier science and the veterinary sciences is that we have used our technology that we have to establish a way to create balance in a horse's foot. One of the uh, biggest advantages that we have or one of the uh, technologies that we feel is so important is x-ray. Well, x-ray looks at bone. It does not look at soft tissue. It's difficult to see soft tissue. So coming from a blacksmith background and farriers coming from that background, we love angles. We love to be able to deal with biomechanics. It was easy to see why we took the angle of the coffin bone to that of the horse's hoof wall, the front wall here, as a means to balance the foot. What I found in my studies is that that often leads to a loss of structure in the back two-thirds of the foot. Well, how important is that? Well, here we see that the frog, or the V that's created by the frog, acts much like a hinge, allowing for distortion in the back two-thirds of the foot, isolating it so that we do not have an extreme amount of distortion towards the front of the foot, but it's isolated on this plane. I'm going to go to the board and draw it on the board for you so that you can see precisely what I'm talking about. If I were to have a hinge, and there was one thing that I, I learned as a blacksmith was that in order to absorb shock, you have to have resistance. Take as an example a piece of string. Is a string act as a spring? Well, obviously it doesn't. There's no resistance until it reaches the end of the string, and then we have what's called a stick which is total resistance. In a spring, we have a variable amount of resistance depending on how much force is applied to it. Well, if I need to absorb shock, would it be better to have a hinge and pro uh, provide resistance to it, allowing it to store energy and release it? If I were to take that and look at it as a hinge, and somebody came to me and said, how could I create a spring to provide resistance to that hinge? 
It was a simple question. As a blacksmith, this is a real easy problem. It's not a difficult spring to create. There's our hinge. There's our spring. It's called a C-spring. This works fine on this two-dimensional plane. It's going to pr provide resistance as that hinge moves in this direction. Or as the hoof, if you will, because you can see that's exactly what we have in the form of bars and wall, is that we do have a spring. If a spring doesn't absorb shock, but it stores and releases energy, where would the shock absorber be? Well, as I started to do dissections on these hoofs, something became very apparent. That is, when we look from the outside of the wall and work our way in, that the tubules which make up our hoof wall, and for those of you not familiar with tubules, they're actually spiral configurations of tubules that are made up of cells, and they provide rigidity to the tubule because they are in a spiral configuration, and they're produced from the coronary band to the ground. As I looked at the hoof very closely, I started to realize that they were not produced evenly all the way around the hoof. In fact, when you look at it, it is quite unique because if we look at a spring, let's take a look at a leaf spring. I'm going to do a drawing of a leaf spring from an automobile. When we look at a spring from an automobile, we have a spring that's shaped like so. And as you come through the spring, you can see that it gets thicker through the center and thinner on the ends. Well, what's interesting is to take a look at the tubule configuration in the hoof wall. It's exactly the same thing. We have very thin coming through here, and I'm going to come around. And as we get towards the toe, it begins to get thicker until we come back into the other side, and it's thin again. That we call our outer wall, made up of a high, a high density of tubules in relationship to what we call intertubular horn, which binds those tubules together. As we progress in on the hoof wall, we see what we call inner wall or intrastratum medium. This inner wall is the non-pigmented wall that lies just inside of the outer wall or tubules. And it's very consistent in a healthy foot in its thickness all the way around the foot. If you were to look at this configuration, as this foot begins to take the energy of impact and distort, we start to see the energy being stored in the hoof capsule just like it would be stored in a spring. That's fine on our two-dimensional plane. But how would I create a spring on a three-dimensional plane? Well, that's quite easy to see. I'm going to take this and try to draw this on a three-dimensional plane for you so you can see what I'm talking about. We're going to create our hinge. And we're going to create our bars and the plane on the bottom. If I wanted to create on a three-dimensional plane, which would be in every direction, as well as straight across, how would I do it? Well, I could take a piece of sheet metal and create a hinge, uh, a spring, to provide resistance to the hinge on a three-dimensional plane, the hoof capsule. It's a marvelous spring, storing and releasing energy. I have found through my studies that the inner wall that we had shown you on the glass drawing here, runs through the whole foot and is produced, we believe, at the lamina. For those of you not familiar with the lamina, it is the attachment of the hoof wall, or what we call the epidermal, to the dermal or the lamina themselves that hold it to the hoof wall. Uh, the best analogy is a pleated lampshade, if you will. And the average hoof has anywhere from 500 to 600 of these leaves or pleats, which run vertically around the hoof capsule, not just around the coffin bone, but also covering all of the cartilage all the way back to the bulbs of the heels and inside the bars. On those primary lamina, which I'm going to try to draw for you, you will see that there are also what we call secondary lamina. I'm going to draw the lamina. We'll try to do this in a three dimension. And on that we have secondary laminae, which protrude off. And it's, the research shows that it's a multiple of about 30. So if we have, oh, 600 average primary lamina, with the fingers in the middle, and we have 30 multiple on the secondary lamina, we've got about 18,000 lamina in the average foot. That translates to about eight square foot of attachment 
of hoof wall to bone. I'll show you where the bone is. We're looking down on a piece of hoof now as if I took and took this hoof off and sliced it approximately here straight across and we're looking down on that hoof and we have here the coffin bone or P3, the third phalanx. As we move away from the bone we have the dermal layer which is here. We begin to see our, excuse me one minute, we'll get the pen. We have what's called the inner wall which is interstratum medium which would be produced at the secondary lamina moving its way out and then in the outer wall we have tubules which are produced at the coronary band from what we call papillae which is small fingers coming off of the coronary band and they're tubules that are produced multiple tubules that are bind that bond very closely together to make up the outer wall and as we move inward towards the bone these tubules are placed farther apart until we get to a point where there are very few if any tubules whatsoever and we have intertubular horn. This is not to scale obviously but it'll give you a good idea as to how this is arranged. What I have seen in my studies <coughs> in this the hoof walls function is that it stores and releases energy at the time of breakover it stores it in the outer hoof wall and excess energy or energy in excess is dealt with by a healthy inner wall which is more like a plastique. The outer wall is made up of multiple tubules which are very rigid and as you move in there's fewer of them so as the density is decreased the flexibility of the inner wall can do what it has to do. As this energy is absorbed it is dissipated through what we call hemodynamics because if we have a spring we have to have a, a shock absorber in its entirety. A gentleman named Dr. Robert Bowker out of Michigan State University had published a theory called hemodynamics where he felt that the blood moving from one part of the foot to the next meeting resistance was responsible for absorbing the majority of the energy created at impact. Now I started to see where I had a more complete theory if you will. We had a spring and we had the makings of a shock absorber. And beyond that, the inner wall acted much like a buffer zone or a bushing, if you will. Remember that drawing I made of the leaf spring in the automobile? Well, every leaf spring has to have an isolator or a bushing to isolate the energy from the frame of the automobile. Well, it's very similar. The analogy is very similar here. We have a spring and we have our frame, the coffin bone, and the sensitive structures that lie directly on the coffin bone. And the inner wall or the intrastratum medium, it acts as a buffer zone between the hard outer wall and the corium within, or the tissue that provides the nourishment that produces this inner wall. So this goes against tradition because now we're looking at the hoof wall and asking, how does the hoof wall grow? How is it possible that we have a horse, a thousand pound animal, standing and supported on an outer hoof wall and we have an attachment of about eight square foot of tissue to a bone? How is it that the hoof wall grows to the ground? And we have attachment and we do not lose the integrity of that attachment. Well, this had come about when I was working on a horse on Long Island. Uh, that I had, been, I had been a farrier for 10 years previously and when I left Long Island to work in upstate New York at the blacksmith shop I gave up practice on this horse. I got a call 10 years later from the woman and said that horse, his name was Max, he was a 16-1 appendix quarter horse, she said Max was lame. Well I made a trip from where I was in upstate New York down to Long Island, about a four hour ride to see Max. Uh, he was now in his 20s. Uh, when she showed me the horse he was wearing four egg bar shoes, which for those of you not familiar is a, a donut sh uh, shaped shoe with four pads. Uh, often one of the prescriptions for shoeing or remedial or corrective shoeing for navicular horses. I proceeded to pull the shoes off and when I pulled the shoes off I could see that the hoof was a very oval shape for the front. What we would like to see is a, a rounder front hoof and a more oval hind hoof because of their function. His foot up front was very oval, about a size one we would call it in traditional sizing. And there was very flat sole and a very thin wall 
a lot of chipping and, and it was very, very brittle. I proceeded to apply what we call the HPT method, which is a trim method that I, I use as my tool in applied equine podiatry, and it is, it is strictly a tool. In a, in a later video, I'll be demonstrating the uh, HPT method. It was applied, and I gave her a prescription, if you will, on what to do with the horse to stimulate the growth we needed in that hoof, to return the structures that we needed. Falling back on what I had developed for a theory, which I'm going to continue on after I explain Max a little bit, you'll see. Uh, what happened with Max. At four weeks I got a call from the owner of Max and she suggested I come down to see Max because he had developed a hole about the size of four fingers at the junction of the sole and white line. She was concerned that he may have popped an abscess. Well, she sent me digital photographs and I quickly realized what it was. I had seen it quite often now that I had been taking horses out of shoes. I made the trip to Long Island and she brought Max out and I put him on the cross ties and I proceeded to, to trim the horse and the first thing I did was just reach in with my fingers and pull out the sole and frog that was being exfoliated. I had a beautiful, concave, healthy sole and frog developing under what had now exfoliated once the foot had begun to function or began to function correctly. What really caught my eye was the fact that in four weeks I started to see new hoof wall growth. This wasn't possible. Traditionally we're taught that the hoof wall grows from the coronary band to the ground and takes about 12 months to occur. How was it that I was seeing new growth at the ground in as little as four weeks? On top of that, the hoof had grown almost a half a shoe size. That's almost a half an inch in diameter. Well, I didn't think much of it at the time, but I trimmed the horse and told her I'd be back again. Four weeks later, the owner called me again and said the horse was due for another trim. Upon returning, I saw that the horse had gone up an entire shoe size. At this point, we were at a size two. The foot was no longer oval but round and had a very healthy wall, good developing sole, and a healthier frog. This did not make a lot of sense. As I looked and examined the hoof wall closely, I started to see that at the junction of the white line, the inner wall had gotten thicker. It wasn't so much that I was seeing outer wall growth as much as I was seeing an increase in the thickness of the inner wall, the non-pigmented wall. How was it that it was showing up at the ground in as little as eight weeks? Well, if we thought about diameter and circumference, it became clear how I went up an entire shoe size in only eight weeks. By increasing the inner wall by only one quarter inch, I increased the overall circumference by over three quarters of an inch. That's where my size was coming from. I was starting to stimulate growth of the inner wall. As time progressed and I started teaching these, that what was happening here, uh, the theories on hoof wall growth began to develop. And at one particular workshop, I did some brainstorming with some of my students, and a gentleman came up with a theory, not a theory, but a principle of fluid dynamics. He said to me, it's very understandable what's happening here and how the hoof wall grows. It's fluid dynamics. And I let him proceed. And what he said was, in fluid dynamics, it's understood that a fluid flowing over a surface is actually stationary at the surface, but as its depth increases, its velocity increases. If we were to take a look at the hoof wall and we would see that the cells being produced by the secondary lamina and think of them as a fluid, very high in viscosity, and as they're produced in depth, in this case in width, as it becomes deeper, the velocity increases so that it can carry the outer hoof wall to the ground, still allowing for stability and stationary with little to no movement at the lamina. That would account for the carrying of the outer wall to the ground without having movement at the lamina. A lot of this became, um, started to show, we started to see some evidence, if you will. The evidence we started to see was in the hoof wall itself. You're all familiar uh, with growth rings. And if you'll take a look at this hoof, you'll see that there's some growth rings that have occurred on the outer hoof wall. These growth rings themselves, uh, I believe, are due to a loss of equilibrium between the growth of the inner wall and the outer wall. At the coronary band, which sits in the coronary groove at the hairline of the hoof, we have what's called papillae. They're very small fingers that protrude off the coronary band that produce the tubules in a spiral configuration. They're bond together by intertubular horn, which is like a superglue that's produced at the valleys of these papillae.
As they're produced, it's said traditionally that their production forces the hoof wall to the ground. Well, this didn't make much sense when, when in the previous sentence or in the previous paragraph I had said to you that there's 600 lamina with a multiple of 30 or 8 square foot of attachment of hoof wall to coffin bone. So it didn't make much sense. But if we take that inner wall, which is being produced just distal or below the coronary band, and we take and look at it as a high viscosity fluid, and as it's produced into or produces more depth, it can carry the outer wall to the ground. Well, what I think is happening here, and we see these growth rings, is that these spiral tubules, if they're trying to grow down faster than the inner wall can carry it, they stack or they start to jam up. And what happens to a spiral when we compress the spiral? The diameter increases. If we take enough of these tubules and increase their diameter in one plane all the way around the hoof, we're going to have a growth ring. Well, what became evidenced in these barefoot horses is that as we trim the horse and provided the proper stimulus for growth of inner wall, the growth rings began to disappear. The only time we did see a growth ring when there was a change in the stimulus to each of the corium, the coronet band or the lamina. If we had a fever, for instance, such as in laminitis, we tend to see an awful lot of growth rings. In a horse that has changed in feed or has a temperature, we tend to see growth rings. On horses that are growing in equilibrium of inner and outer wall, the growth rings are dissipated. On top of that, we saw evidence that pointed to the fact that it was truly a shock absorber or a means by which to dissipate the energy that wasn't stored and released at breakover. Because just like in an automobile, if you have a spring that is absorbing energy and releasing it, if you don't have something to deal with the excess energy, you have uncontrolled rebound. That's what happens with a shock absorber. How many of you have driven a car with a bad shock absorber? You sit and hit the bump in the car, it's bouncing down the road. You had a shock absorber to deal with the excess energy that's dealt with, that kinetic energy, so that it dissipates it in the form of dampening or the release of heat. If we were to take a look at the inner wall and thinking of it as a, as a plastique capable of dealing with that energy, it acts as a buffer zone between the hard outer wall acting as a spring and the corium which produces the inner wall. The corium is the tissue that allows for the production of this and is the nourishing tissue. We can protect the bone and this tissue if we have a buffer zone. Evidence to this was we see in the white line. The white line itself is an avascular structure. It means it has no blood and nerves. But what makes up the white line is intertubular horn, or the, the inner wall that's produced at the lamina. And it also is made up of special tubules, or very distinct tubules, that are produced by what we call terminal papillae. Remember I had mentioned that papillae produce the tubules of the outer wall? Well, there are now evidence is showing that we have very specialized papillae called terminal papillae that rim the entire bottom of the internal foot. Around the bottom of the coffin bone and the cartilage which makes up the back part of the foot are terminal papillae. They go from inside the bar all the way around the distal border. They produce a very tough tubule that when, when they join with the intertubular horn from the lamina, produce our white line. The function of the white line is quite simple, to join the sole to the wall and to prevent infiltration of foreign matter or bacteria to that all-important dermal layer so that we do not get things such as abscess or gravels. When we see bruising in that white line, it's evidence that we did not have enough of a buffer zone. We didn't have enough inner wall. And that hard outer wall, sending that extra energy towards the coffin bone, would be similar to having hard to hard, which would cause capillary rupture. This blood serum would show up in the tissues or in the cell that's produced by these lamina, or secondary lamina, or by the terminal papillae showing up as bruising in the white line. When we have good inner wall production, we don't see as much bruising. There's less evidence of bruising. So it points to the function of the wall as being multiple. There are multiple functions of the hoof wall. Well, we have part of a shock absorber, but I, in my own mind, it wasn't quite enough. How else could this foot be dealing with that energy? And again, if dampening was the, was the was how we were getting rid of the energy, or the principle to get rid of that energy, where was it going? 
We're taught that circulation and pumping of blood is how we absorb shock. And to a, to a degree, that's correct. If we were to take a look at the hoof and uh, dissect it out, if you will, we see that there are a number of reservoirs within the foot. A shock absorber works by taking fluid in one reservoir and forcing it to another reservoir through an orifice which provides resistance. This changes the energy to heat, and the heat is dissipated through the fluid. Well, we have the same thing happening in the foot, and I mentioned hemodynamics earlier in this video, and that was a theory that was developed by Dr. Robert Bowker. And he simply states the blood moving from one part of the foot to the next, meeting resistance, absorbs shock. But that's very, very simplistic, and it doesn't quite explain it. He has much more to his theory. And coupling that theory with flexion, and the theory that I have on the growth of the outer wall and the inner wall puts together a model that we can use to develop treatment of the horse's foot. Hemodynamics is a bit more complicated, and I want to give you a couple of analogies on how hemodynamic works in conjunction with flexion and the inner wall to dissipate the energy, and also how we store this energy and use it in the form of locomotion. I'm going to have to uh, go to a, another drawing or to go to another picture here, and I'll show you how this uh, actually happens. If we were to look at the hoof as having a number of reservoirs, uh, anatomically there are what we call venous plexuses within the foot. There are five very distinct venous plexuses. They are the solar venous plexus, the digital cushion venous plexus, lateral cartilage venous plexus, lamella venous plexus, and coronary venous plexus. Each one of these venous plexuses is a network of capillaries and blood vessels which supplies the blood for the nourishment of the corium and the return of spent blood, if you will, through the veins back to the heart. Each one of these is uh, specific to a location in the foot nourishing that structure. If, in fact, hemodynamics is a viable theory, it would be the resistance met with that blood moving from one venous plexus to the next. But there was uh, something further we have to understand. And when I talked to Robert Bowker about this, I asked him, could we explain it a little, a little simpler? Is it simply the blood meeting resistance? And he explained that, no, you had to have good structure in order for hemodynamics to be a, functioning, uh, a function of the foot in order to absorb shock. Basically, the analogy was quite simple. He said, we have the venous plexus, and the energy is generated in the foot. But if we don't have good structure to transmit that energy to the blood vessels, there's no possible way that it could deal with that energy. So an analogy was, was uh, developed. And that analogy is if we have a stainless steel basin that's empty, and we run a hose filled with a fluid through that basin, and we take a hammer and hit the side of that stainless steel basin, it creates shock waves. But how much of the shock is actually going to be transmitted to that hose? Very little, if any, here and here. But if we fill that basin with some type of medium, a water, a gel, a very firm plastique, and then we hit that basin, the energies can be transmitted to that hose so that it can be dissipated in the form of dampening meeting resistance as it moves to the next venous plexus. Then you have to take into consideration what structures. What structures are responsible for transmitting that energy? Which structures have to be the healthiest? And what would be a healthy structure? Things were starting to come together in the suspension theory of hoof dynamics. We now had a spring for storing energy. We had a shock absorber or a shock absorbing system for dissipating the energy. We did need circulation, but was that all of the functions that were needed in the foot. There was a study that came out, uh, that, out of France that tested a number of plastic and rubber shoes or glue-on shoes, and they were testing for the amount of shock that they absorbed. And there was a company that had a shoe that they claimed absorbed more shock than the bare foot. But when I looked at the horses that were shod with this shoe, there didn't seem to be any more of an improvement in the hoof itself. The horse may go sounder or may be usable with this glue-on or plastic shoe, but the hoof itself still had the same problems time and time again. Underrun heels, flare, 
excessive toe, brittle walls. That brought about another question. Could this shock or this pressure or energy have another function in the foot? What was the stimulus for correct growth? You heard me mention before, remember that pressure seems to be the stimulus for correct growth. If pressure is the stimulus for correct growth, we also have to understand that too much pressure would be bad and too little pressure would be bad. We had to develop a model based on the suspension theory of hoof dynamics which used the internal structures. In order to do that, we had to do a number of dissections. I developed a theory based on what we call the internal arch. The internal arch is the internal structures of the foot that make up the majority of the back part of the foot. The internal arch is extremely important in applied equine podiatry. Traditionally when we trim a foot we use the coffin bone and the dorsal hoof wall, the pastern angle and the shoulder angle in order to establish balance in the horse's foot. It's understandable why I mentioned before x-rays. It's a technology that we have available to us that allows us to see the bone therefore if we balance the hoof to the bone surely we must be doing what's correct for the foot. Well, studies indicate now, taking all of this into consideration, particularly the suspension theory of hoof dynamics, that if we need correct pressure, that the angle of the coffin bone isn't what is most important, but the stimulus that is applied to the structures in the back two-thirds of the foot is. So once we developed a model on proper balance, which established a correct internal arch, we were able to develop a tool, which I called the HPT model, or the high performance trim model, and the HPT method, a method by which to establish the model. The model itself was developed after doing a number of dissections. We started with a hundred cadavers. Taking each hoof and developing a grading system based on a number of papers that are published in the veterinary journals and throughout um, you will find on the internet and various veterinary journals and textbooks on what is considered to be correct hoof wall, what is considered to be a healthy frog, a healthy sole, lateral cartilages, digital cushion, sole, and so forth. We took all of these structures and developed a grading system that allowed us to grade the hoof so that we could grade each individual hoof out of the hundred, then remove the hoof capsule, removing all external influences on the foot of the horse or the internal dermal layer and measure the arch that is crea created by the internal structures. Let's take a look at this internal arch that I'm talking about. What I did was we, we graded each one of these hoof capsules from 0 to 10 and took the worst as a 0 and the best as a 10, which we couldn't find. Uh, the best we could find would be about an 8. And we removed the hoof capsules, removing all influence from the dermal layer or the internal arch. And we took a measurement on that arch and compared it to the quality of the hoof. What we found was that the arch varied in height and it depended on how high the arch was as to the quality. Let's take a look at that right now. And I'll show you how that's done, how we did our, our, our research and what was done with the internal arch. If we were to look at the internal structures of the foot, we would have the coffin bone the front third of the foot. Attached to the coffin bone are lateral cartilages which make up the majority of the back part of the foot. Attached to, to the solar surface of that we have what we call the sensitive frog. It's a bit large, we'll come down a little more. And it attaches to our coronary band. When the hoof capsule is removed and we place this on a flat plane at the widest part of the coffin bone, we determined the height of the arch from a flat plane. And what we found in our study was that the healthiest hoof capsule was, showed us an arch of close to six millimeters or about a quarter of an inch in height. This translated into the healthiest foot. It had the healthiest lateral cartilage, the best sensitive frog, and the proper angle for the coffin bone to be sitting. It had very little to do with the outer hoof wall and angle to the coffin bone. In other words, traditionally what we do is we take the hoof capsule, 
and we want to have it parallel to the front of the coffin bone, and we try to align the, cof the um, front of the hoof with the pastern and the shoulder. By doing that, we pretty much eliminate the back part of the foot. Well, the reason I said before was because we can't see it. X-rays basically burn it out. You can't see it on an x-ray, not on a, on a normal x-ray. We do have MRI now, and I think MRI is going to prove this out, that the important dimensions we want will involve the, what we call the internal arch. By developing a healthy internal arch, you'll find that we will develop healthy outer structure. Traditionally, we're taught that the hoof wall, or the outer hoof, is a mirror image of the inside. When in reality, the inside is a mirror image of the outside. The stimulus that produces our corium, which in turn produces our outer wall, our horn, is the pressure from the outer capsule. Therefore, as we change the outer capsule, we're going to change the stimulus on the corium, therefore developing internal structures differently. So by developing a model based on a correct internal arch, we could develop a plane to establish dimensions to trim the hoof capsule to. If we take a look at the traditional means by which we balance using the coffin bone, we can see we could run into problems. If we take a hoof that often has poor quality, such as underrun heels and weak frog and the other problems that we run into, uh, we'll often look at an x-ray and the coffin bone will be out of balance. It'll be either broken back axis, which is what we call when the coffin bone is rotated backwards, or we can have a broken forward axis when the pastern is ro rotated forward along with the coffin bone. If we feel the angle of the coffin bone is incorrect, or the angle to the wall and pastern is incorrect, we often use degree pads or some other means by which to raise or lower the angle of the coffin bone. Well, if in reality we have what we call a fallen arch, where the, where the arch is not strong, it's weak, and instead of having an arch, we have it flat, and then we turn around and look on x-ray and say that we have to raise the angle of the coffin bone, we raise the angle of the coffin bone with a degree pad, it would be equivalent to taking a woman with fallen arches and putting her into high heels. We have done very little using the stimulus of pressure, or correct pressure, which is needed for developing good structure, and we have taken and put that pressure where it's not needed and where it doesn't belong. By having these underdeveloped structures, a lot, if not the majority of the kinetic energy or the shock of impact is being transmitted to the soft tissue and not dealt with correctly by being dissipated through the inner wall, outward through the inner wall, and through the various lateral cartilages and through the venous plexuses. So the whole um, premise behind the suspension of the foot dynamics is to develop the structures we need. Remember that formula. Structure plus function equals performance. We now have what I need to fill that formula. I understand what correct structure is. I understand the function of each of those structures it, much farther than we have been in the last 300 years. And we understand what we want for performance. But now I needed to develop a model. If I wanted to develop the pressures to create an arch, how could I trim the hoof to get that correct arch? Well, if we were to look at the outside of the hoof, there are landmarks which we found through dissection and through doing numerous trims, and other researchers have found that at the widest part of the foot on the solar surface, which is located at the junction of the white line to the sole at its widest part, we found that the sole here is even in depth over the coffin bone, both medial and lateral, or inside and outside. If we were to take those two landmarks, we now have a landmark for achieving balance on the, what we call the distal to proximal plane, medial and lateral. And I'm going to go over the different dimensions that we need to create a model. Because traditionally, it's my opinion that we do not label enough dimensions and do not use the appropriate dimensions in the balancing of the hoof capsule to the foot or the internal arch. I want to discuss what we deal with traditionally uh, in terms of balance. Traditionally, we talk about three dimensions, if you will. We talk about medial lateral balance, which traditionally would be medial to lateral looking at the heels of the foot. Most people, when I ask them what medial lateral balance is or balance from right to left, they would show me on their hands, this is medial lateral balance. They also talk about, or we talk about in traditional farrier science, anterior posterior balance.
Traditionally, if I were to show you that with my hands, this would be anterior posterior. Where is the, the angle of the hoof, front to back? Yaw is a dimension that would indicate where is the hoof capsule in relationship to its center line around it. In developing the model, I quickly realized if I needed to create a plane that would tell me how I wanted the internal arch or would mimic the plane of the internal arch, I needed to label more di dimensions than this. If we were to look at medial lateral balance, and I have a drawing that will show the dimensions, if I were to look at medial to lateral balance, what we truly, truly are looking at is where is the hoof capsule in relationship to the center line on the medial lateral plane. If we look at anterior posterior, which we label as dorsal to palmar, dorsal being front, palmar being the back, dorsal to palmar would be where is the toe and heel located in relationship to the widest part of the foot, or what we label as the point of articulation, the point at which the hoof flexes or moves about its center axis. That would be approximately the widest part of the foot. In applied equine podiatry, I quickly came to the conclusion that the dimensions that we use in traditional fairy science would not suffice. I needed to label far more dimensions in order to establish a plane that would mimic the internal arch. The dimensions that we use from medial to lateral traditionally actually represent distal to proximal or farthest from and closest to on the top to bottom plane. That is what we label as distal to proximal. We need to label medial to lateral for what it is. Where is the hoof capsule in relationship to the center line on the medial lateral plane? Anterior posterior, again, actually labels the distal to proximal dimension for what we call the dorsal to palmar plane, the front to the back. Where are the heels and toe in relationship to the widest part of the foot, or what we, class, we call the point of articulation, the center of our coffin joint, which is approximately the widest part of the hoof. We term it as the widest part of the foot, and we trim the hoof to the foot. We develop a footprint and a hoof print, balancing the hoof print to the footprint. So we now have medial lateral balance, dorsal to palmar balance. We also have distal to proximal on both the medial lateral and dorsal to palmar. So now we have three. Yaw, which we also use, which is where is the hoof capsule in relationship to its center line? And the fifth dimension, time. Time is actually the most important dimension. After all, how long does it take most of us to do a trim? Obviously, some of us 20 minutes, some of us two to three hours. But it's still a very small amount of time in comparison to the time between these trims. That time, the influence of the environment is critical. What pressures are being applied to the hoof during that dimension of time? If we can establish balance of the hoof capsule to the dimensions that are required for the internal arch, and we can apply the proper stimulus through the environment, we can develop the structures we need internally to deal with function and get performance. Remember, as I said before, structure plus function equals performance. We understand now that we need a strong internal arch. The structures that make up that arch are the coffin bone, the lateral cartilages, the digital cushion, the sensitive frog, and the coronary band as well as all of the venous plexuses and the corium that produces the horn from that corium. So all of those structures need to be stimulated to get proper structure in order to get the proper function. What are functions? If before I said that the functions that we listed were actually performance, then what are the functions? Well, a lot of these functions are actually neurological functions, such things as proprioception, Circulation. Circulation, though it is influenced by biomechanics, it is ultimately a neurological function. And the importance of having proper structure and location of various structures in relationship to the joint is critical.
I have found that in the development of the model and through further research, that location of the heel, or actually what we call the angle of the bar or the ground surface of the heel, needs to be approximately at the widest part of the frog. In the development of the model, I looked at a number of trims that are being done. Back when I started this, almost eight years ago, there were a number of trims that were being done at the time. We had the natural balance trim. We had the four point trim. We had the hoof talk trim. We had the power trim. They were all different trims that were based on the wild horse. I myself didn't believe that the wild horse was the best model to use in the development of a, of a trim or a technique or a method or a science that would deal with the foot itself. We needed to develop true equine podiatry. Taking a look at a, a drawing or a, a schematic of the bottom of the horse's foot will allow us to better understand where each structure should be located in relationship to the point of articulation. Where the heels belong became uh, an extremely important factor because the placement of the heels would determine the timing for the, for, the, um, for the circulation as to how much pressure would be applied and for how long that pressure would be applied at the time of impact. A study by Chris Pollitt of, out of Australia showed, uh, showed us the circulation of the horse's foot, something we had difficulty seeing before. He used various uh, radiographic techniques to show us the circulation of a horse's foot when, when placed under load. At about 1,000 kilograms, the horse's foot uh, is under full stride, and we could see the circulation. And throughout the video that he had produced, he would explain that the blood would be pumped through the foot by the movement of the pastern. And as the pastern descended, there was a point where he said, as the pastern descends, the blood to the foot is shut off. And at that point, no blood enters or leaves the foot. And he makes a statement, this is an important finding, and continues on. When we look at that statement, and we use it in conjunction with the suspension theory of hoof dynamics, hemodynamics, and flexion, it, became, it becomes extremely important as to where the heels are located in respect in relationship to that point of articulation because it will determine the timing at which the blood is shut off and the blood is released. If we understand that as the foot strikes the ground and the pastern descends, the blood is shut off. Now no blood can enter or leave the foot. The pressure is building within that foot as we enter the stride phase, as the foot is under full load and the foot begins to distort. And the blood moving from one venous plexus to the next without the ability to leave the foot is applying pressure to the corium, which will determine the growth of each of the structures within the foot. So the timing for, uh, that is responsible for that is determined by heel placement and breakover. Traditionally, we worry about breakover. Uh, it is, is one of the most important uh, aspects of a trim or of a, a shoeing is to create proper breakover. All too often we look at anterior-posterior balance and the length of the toe to determine breakover. If we are truly to get true balance, if we, we want to get true balance in the horse's foot, we need to be aware of where the heels are located and where they contact the ground at the time of impact. And when we take a look at this, this schematic and this drawing, you will see that we have found that having the angle of the bar, we term it, in any science, we have to label structures so that we can be very specific. That's the reason we have medial, lateral, dorsal, palmar, as opposed to saying right and left or front to back, because it makes it very specific to the organ we're working on. On the hoof, we like to call the heel that contacts the ground, the angle of the bar, or the angle of the wall. That's the area of the, of the ground surface of the heel, this area here. That's the angle of the bar. The most palmar aspect of it should be parallel to or slightly forward of the widest part of the frog. Having it farther forward or having it too high will change the timing at which the blood is shut off or is sealed in the foot, giving us a sealed mechanism, a sealed unit, and it will also change the timing at which it's going to break over. So this is an extremely important structure and having it in the proper position is critical. As the model developed, we realized that I could use 
individual landmarks on the foot that would allow us to trim the foot to get a plane parallel to the internal arch. Those positions are located at the widest part of the footprint and on the highest and widest point of the frog. In order to, to illustrate this, I want you to look at a drawing that will allow us to see a footprint and a hoof print on the horse. And what's interesting is, in, in the last eight years of doing research, the footprint remains very consistent to the internal structures of the foot, where the hoof print becomes deformed and changes shape due to uh, the environmental stimuluses. So I'm going to take this drawing and label, you will see labeled the particular structures that we're dealing with, which make up the hoof and the foot. I have the frog in the center of the foot, and I have outlined the outer wall. If we were to take and add the white line, which is the junction of the sole to the wall, we can take a point at the apex of the frog, and this is terminology you'll need to know if you are going to practice applied equine podiatry and you're going to apply the HPT method because we map out each individual foot so that we can trim the hoof into balance with the foot. The apex of the frog or the tip of the frog is located at the junction of the tissue from the frog to the sole. The central sulcus is the groove that we see at the center of the frog. The central sulcus, if we go to the bulbs of the heel, will come to the central sulcus here. And we can put a mark and draw a center line down our hoof by connecting the two dots and going right off the end of the foot, creating the center line of our footprint. If we now take a straight edge, we could use any straight edge in the practice of the trim. We're going to use the rasp. And we are going to take that straight edge and move from the center line out, parallel to the center line, until we are at the lateral side of the hoof, at the junction of the white line to sole. Where it touches is our widest part of the footprint. And this is going to be here on this particular hoof. If we draw a line that is perpendicular to our center line, 90 degrees, we create the widest part of our footprint. The two locations at the white line, at the widest part of the footprint, will be used to establish balance on a medial to lateral plane. The footprint itself can be outlined by taking the junction of the sole and white line around the toe. I think it's better if we take a look at it in contrast. We will go around the junction of the sole to the white line, across the widest part of the foot. This will be the front of our footprint. The apex of the frog to what we call the bottom of our collateral grooves at the most palmar aspect of the foot or the bulbs of the heels. These collateral grooves are the grooves to the side of the frog. Deep in the collateral groove, we make a point on each side and connect to create a triangle. This triangle along with the front of that footprint, basically a mushroom, is the footprint of the horse. And after looking at hundreds and thousands of hooves, it became apparent that this footprint stays very consistent from horse to horse. There are changes to the toe of the footprint, but at its widest point, the apex of the frog, in the widest part of that frog, the footprint stays very consistent. By using these landmarks at the widest and highest point of the frog, we can establish a plane. Let's take a look at this in three dimension so that you can understand why we had to establish a plane to mimic the internal arch. If I were to use the same points physically on the hoof, we would actually be trimming the toe far too low. So if we take a look at it in three dimension, and we have our white line, we have 
two points at the widest part of the hoof and the highest and widest point of the frog. If I were to take these three points on the physical, you could see that I would go right through my toe. But if I know that the healthiest arch is approximately six millimeters or approximately a quarter inch in height, if I add to the center of my plane, or these two points off the live sole one quarter inch, and connect these three points, I now create a plane that mimics what I want for a healthy internal arch. And the pressures that I stimulate through the structures that I create in the method, or the HPT, I will establish the structures I need. So this is what we use. And on this plane, once we establish that plane, we do establish balance on all four physical planes. I have dorsal to palmar. I have medial to lateral. I have distal to proximal on both planes, which would be top to bottom, would be proximal to distal. And I have rotational balance or yaw. Now if I were to put a hoof capsule right on that schematic, you can see how we achieve balance with the trim if we use that plane. So basically what I want to do is to trim the hoof capsule on that plane so that we put the hoof into balance with the foot or the internal arch. We're not concerned with the angle of the coffin bone. Too much has been, um, too much attention has been paid to the coffin bone. Here I have a coffin bone and there are quite a few theories on a ground parallel coffin bone, and I want to mention this because I think it's one of the worst things we could possibly do on the horse's foot is achieve a ground parallel coffin bone on all planes. It should be ground parallel on our medial to lateral plane, but not on a dorsal to palmar plane. That would mean a fallen arch. We need to have a proper angle to the coffin bone, but we cannot use an x-ray because it doesn't show us the soft tissue. We need to understand how the soft tissue is developing the structures that we see externally. And that means understanding that structure, knowing what good structure is, knowing how to stimulate that good structure. Pressure is the stimulus. Exceeding the pressure that the structure can take means trauma. That's how we end up with abscesses. It's how we end up with navicular syndrome. It's how we end up with such things as pedal osteitis or a deterioration of the coffin bone from having a ground parallel coffin bone or having too high an angle on the coffin bone without having an arch to store and release the energy properly. So all of these things have to be addressed and we do that with the model, the HPT model, by using these dimensions and the most important dimension of time and the environment you as the owner can take this information, the theory, and apply it in applied equine podiatry to establish the performance we want. Follow these simple, simple principles. There are a number of things that developed as I started to practice applied equine podiatry, particularly when I started to teach. I realized that I had a, a major responsibility in teaching. And in developing my theories and in developing applied equine podiatry as opposed to equine podiatry as it's taught by the farrier sciences because in reality equine podiatry has been practiced for about 30 years by the traditional farriers or farrier sciences and the veterinary sciences but always following the farrier sciences in the application of a horseshoe. You know the essence of equine podiatry and I had mentioned that I want to read to you out of my book what the essence of equine podiatry is and I have it right here and simply stated in my book The Chosen Road the essence of equine podiatry is the conscientious study of the equine foot, always striving to expose it to the proper environmental stimuli, making every effort to promote structure and function as we attempt to achieve high performance. It is accepting the fact that the horse has the innate ability to heal itself and that man's interference may have caused imbalance and broken the golden rule of do no harm. Now, as I develop that for use at the Institute, of equine podiatry, I, I realized how important that one principle was, do no harm. As we get to horses that have been in shoes for a very long period of time or have been in a poor environment and developed poor structure to their feet, we, we often see these horses 
are maintaining usability with a shoe and the immediate removal of the shoe will show lameness. Does that mean we have done harm? In my opinion, no, we haven't done harm. The shoe is, re is replacing a lack of structure and the shoe does not provide the stimulus needed to get that good structure. So by simply applying applied equine podiatry and applying correct equine podiatry, we can promote the stimulus to get the good structure. We are not barefooters. I want it understood that equine podiatry is the study of the, of the horse's foot, always exposing it to proper environment. Shoeing isn't the necessary evil. It's the lack of knowledge that necessitates the shoeing that is the true evil. If we understand what the proper stimulus is, and we understand how to create balance to get that stimulus, and we create the proper environment, we can return structure to the horse's foot, achieve performance, because we'll have structure, plus correct function and high performance. At that point, it's up to the owner to decide, do we need a shoe? In most cases, we don't. There may be some disciplines that do need shoes. We're not totally against the shoes, but you have to understand that once you put a shoe on, the stimulus is not correct to achieve the proper structure, and we may end up going back or maintaining where we're at. The bottom line is, everything should go without shoes, and we should be promoting a healthy foot before we decide to do anything else. It amazes me how often a person, you know, I'll, I'll hear a person say, my horse had a bowed tendon, and the vet said he has to be laid up for three months, and we don't hesitate. But we'll have an expert come along that says your horse's foot is about a, is, is way down on the scale of usability. It needs to be taken care of for the next three months. You need to give the horse time off without shoes. You need to promote proper stimulus, and you balk, and you say, let's put a shoe on. In other words, let's put a cast on that foot and keep going. The foot needs to repair. It needs the, the horse needs the time to rehabilitate its own foot. Provide, you need to provide the environment, and the horse needs to have the time for that environment to develop the structures it needs. That's applied equine podiatry. That's achieving high performance. Every horse deserves to have the best foot it can. Applied equine podiatry, I think it's our next science. I think it's something we need. Looking back on our theories, looking back on what we've, we've accomplished over the last eight years, one thing that we haven't had in the ferry sciences over the last 300 years is a solid model. Something that we can take all of the information that's being established with all of this research that's being done, take that data and plug it into the model so that we can use it. One of the problems we see today is that we have not established evidence-based uh, medicine for the horse's foot. Equine podiatry will help to establish evidence-based medicine. It'll be a long time before all of this filters its way down to the farrier sciences. If we can take applied equine podiatry and apply it today in the form of knowing and understanding that structure plus function equals performance and that we have a model we can follow to develop good structure, we're going to help thousands of horses. I hope you'll visit my website, equinepodiatry.net, and I hope to see you in the future. Robin and I are excited to announce that a percentage of the, of the proceeds of this video will be donated to Dave Lapierre Memorial Fund to provide a scholarship for students in applied equine podiatry. For more information on this scholarship fund, contact Robin Lapierre at equinepodiatry.net. We thank you.